afternoon's panel on the social cost of pornography. I'm the moderator for today. My name is Dr. Nancy Coppola, and I'm the CEO of Program Reach, a not-for-profit based out of Bronx, New York. We work on youth development programs, and our main focus is to teach kids to avoid the risks associated with alcohol, tobacco, drugs, violence, and to avoid sexual activities and other things that we do a little of with our youth is getting them to understand how media is not their friend. And the main reason that we teach them that media is not their friend is primarily because of everything that's going on with pornography. And there is a growing body of research, clearly, that suggests that the habitual use of pornography, especially internet pornography, can damage people of all ages and both sexes in a negative manner that impacts not only on their own lives, but their relationships, their productivity, their happiness, and their general ability to function in society. So these are among the social costs of pornography. And we know that pornography is nothing new. However, since the internet age, pornography has been consumed in greater quantities than ever before in human history, and its content continues to grow more graphic. I think the recent decision of Playboy to no longer have nude photos shows how much the internet has impacted pornography. So recent research does suggest that consumption of more hardcore and more violent pornography has negative effects on individuals and thus on society as a whole. In 2005, I had the opportunity to meet at an international conference a young man who had struggled with both a cocaine addiction and a pornography addiction. And he described how overcoming his cocaine addiction was difficult but possible because he could change his setting and change the people he hung out with. And with determination, he was able to successfully overcome that addiction. And at the time I met him, he had spent three years being drug free. However, he said to me, overcoming my porn addiction is proving to be far more difficult. In his own words, he said, Porn is everywhere I go. There is no escaping. It's on TV, it's on billboards, and it's even on the side of the bus that I ride. This young man explained to me that he had lost his wife, lost his children, lost his job, and still could not find the strength to overcome that addiction. Sadly, his case is not an isolated one. So our speakers this afternoon will shed some light on the social cost of pornography for us. I'm going to introduce our three distinguished speakers all at once and then turn it over to them to inform us and engage us for the rest of the afternoon. What I'm going to ask you to do is hold all of your questions till the end. Each of the speakers will do their presentations and then we'll open up a general Q&A. So our first speaker is Dr. Don Hilton who is an adjunct associate professor of neurosurgery at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio, where he is the director of spine fellowship and the director of neurosurgical training at Methodist Hospital. His research and his publishing interests have included traumatic brain injury, minimally invasive surgery, and neural mechanisms of addiction. He has authored recent peer-reviewed journal articles on addiction, including papers published in the Journal of the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences, Socio-Effective Neuroscience and Psychology, Sexual Addiction and Compulsivity, and Surgical Neurology International, where he serves on their editorial board. He also serves on the board of directors of the Washington, D.C.-based National Center on Sexual Exploitation. Dr. Hilton spoke at the Society for the Advancement of Sexual Health in 2012 and was the keynote speaker of the International Institute for Trauma and Addiction Professionals Symposium in Phoenix, Arizona in 2014. He recently spoke in the Parliament Building in Warsaw, Poland in a hearing on the public health aspects of pornography and in a similar forum in the U.S. Capitol Building and the Congressional Briefing. I've been in some of those congressional briefings, so I applaud you for even putting your foot in that building. He and his wife, Jana, have five children and five grandchildren. Dr. Hilton will be speaking to us this afternoon about how pornography addicts and exploits. 
Our second speaker, Patrick Truman, is the President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, formerly called Morality and Media, which is a national and non-for-profit organization established in 1962. Formerly, Mr. Truman served as the Chief of the Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section, Criminal Division of the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. These gentlemen like to be in hostile territory, I say. <laughs> this is the office charged with the prosecution of both adult and child pornography crimes, as well as sexual exploitation of children. Since leaving the Department of Justice, Patrick has also served as a legal consultant to the federal government's Rescue and Restore Anti-Trafficking Campaign, training federal, state, and local law enforcement officials on human trafficking. Mr. Truman has traveled throughout the world to speak and train on the issue of human trafficking and pornography and to deliver papers on the effects of sexual exploitation and violence on culture and family. During his 39 years as a lawyer, he has litigated cases at all levels of the federal system, including in the United States Supreme Court. He has been an advisor to many municipalities on First Amendment law and has helped draft ordinances to end or curb the impact of strip clubs and other sexually exploitive businesses. Mr. Truman will be speaking to us today on the public health crisis of pornography and how sexually exploitive culture trains boys to be predators and our girls to be victims. Our final speaker, and always last but not least, Brian Willoughby, PhD, is an assistant professor in the School of Family Life at Brigham Young University. Dr. Willoughby is an expert in the field of couple and marital relationships, sexuality, and young adult development. His research generally focuses on how adolescents, young adults, and adults move toward and form long-term committed relationships. His research has been widely cited in the media, appearing in such outlets as USA Today, MSNBC, Men's Health, The Washington Post, ABC News, NPR, and Prevention Magazine. Dr. Willoughby is also currently the executive director of the Relate Institute, a nonprofit organization with the specific task of, task of developing research and outreach tools for romantic couples. Dr. Willoughby will be speaking with us about the relational costs of pornography with a focus on how such costs may influence the younger generation where pornography is becoming increasingly common. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers. Places on the floor. If those of you standing would, would want to sit on the floor, I mean, just don't block the door. That's it. Yeah, yeah. That's not testing. Testing. It's <laughs> just. Okay, you're on. Just what he had. Testing. 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 It's just for the audio. I know, but I may have put this for you. <laughs> Welcome. It's, uh, it's wonderful to have this opportunity with you today. And I think this is great. Uh, Pat and Brian are both friends. I've known both of them for some time and just uh, I'm really excited to be with them this afternoon. And we're just going to take about 25 minutes, which is not much time for either, any of them. Okay. It's, it's a, a very brief moment. I really can't get into brain science on pornography much. I'm going to do a little bit. Uh, feel free to take photographs of my slides. They're going to have references. And afterwards, if you have a thumb drive, I'll do a thumb drive. I, I always tell people I'll try to email them, but I'm really bad. I'm, it's hard for me to do it. So if you want a thumb drive, I'll be happy to give them to you. You ever had something happen in your life, and all of a sudden everything's different, but you didn't know it at the time? Um, or society has that happen, too. You know, things are going along just fine, and all of a sudden an event happens. And we really don't get it when it happens. We think that life is going to be the same, but actually everything after that event is different. You remember the Spindle Top Gusher in 1900 in Beaumont, Texas. Uh, everyone thought, well, that's black stuff. What's that all about? It's oil. But then Henry Ford shortly thereafter built a Model T and an assembly line, and the world changed, right? The little events back then, I don't think they really got how big it would change the world. And of course, then you have the telephone. You have uh, telephones coming around. And you have Thomas Edison inventing this thing called a light bulb. You know where things turn on. No more candles and gas and all. And uh, then this fly, short little flight just above the ground. 
And that's why we're here today. We've all caught flights and have flights to go home. The whole world changes with just pivotal moments. Man on the moon. Uh, in a garage, Bill Gates and some other guys invented this nerdy thing called the computer with Microsoft, and they got it working. What's all that about? <laughs> and, of course, then these computers started talking to each other. And in 1992, the Internet came around. And uh, it was uh, actually in September of 1990, September 10th, that a group of journalists networked and said, wow, let's do a, a search engine for papers so we don't have to go through all these journals anymore. So they had the idea of doing a search site. This is the first Google that started. And of course, that's look where we are today with iPhones, with literally everything we need to know, every, whoever we need to talk to, carrying around in our pocket all the time. Fabulous technology that we can use. Unfortunately, also, it's pocket porn for 14-year-olds, for 12-year-olds. Now, we didn't really realize then, in 1992, how the world was changing. It was just like the spindle top gusher, but we didn't know it yet. We had already culturally gone down the minute that happened in one way, and we didn't even get it. The anonymity, affordability, accessibility, the unlimited novelty, the video versus still photos, you know, Marilyn Monroe's centerfold in 1953 in the first edition of Playboy by Hugh Hefner. Um, long shot from anything that 12-year-old Johnny can pull up on his iPhone today. It's a supernormal stimulus. I'll talk about that briefly. And it is biologically addictive. And when you see press releases saying porn is not addictive, don't believe them. I'll touch briefly on why they say that today. So, and this is Huffington Post. They're not really trying to be anti-porn here. They're just stating, almost bragging, that hey, porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. YouTube, look at this, you porn. That's just one of the many sites, Porn Wiki, Porn Hub, owned by a company called MindGeeks. Who's heard of MindGeeks? Handful of mine, I'm not you got so a few of us. Uh, MindGeeks is the largest porn monopoly in the world, okay? Owns virtually every porn site on the internet. Where's the FTC on this? Well, anyone else would be called a monopoly, but because it's porn, they look the other way. 70% of men, 30% of women. Jennifer Johnson, uh, this is by her permission, I'm using this slide. She's a friend, I've done several conferences with her. She's the chairman of sociology at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia used to work for the Defense Department looking at internet nodes. And now, Jennifer works and looks at pornography nodes. And she looks at different websites. There's like 24, 25 million porn websites. And so it's endless novelty. This is what it looks like to a consumer. All these nodes which contain multiple sites that link into the node. So it looks like millions of owners of porn sites are making millions of dollars. We'll come back to that slide at the end. But it is endless novelty. In fact, this researcher out of Montreal said, we started our research seeking men in their 20s who had never consumed pornography. We couldn't find any. Sadly, this is a true statement. So a few years ago, Clark Watts and I, he's a neurosurgeon who's also a professor of law at UT Law School, wrote an editorial for Surgical Neurology International, a peer-reviewed <coughs> journal in my field of neurosurgery. In it, based on brain science and DNA structure and function in addiction, we predicted that porn would show, as drug addiction shows, both structural abnormalities and metabolic abnormalities in our paper. And immediately, some, I would call them almost pro-porn academics, at least softer on porn academics, attacked our findings and said, impossible. You'll never see any of these. We also, and I'll come back to that in a minute, but also in our paper, we call for a public health approach to pornography. We used cholera as an example to do a public health look at pornography. In other words, whether or not we have a religious view of pornography, fine. Why, we don't bring that into the public health sphere. In the public health sphere, we talk about science, not religion or morals. So let's look at this little sign. This basically starts with Anthony Schutte. This is the first tobacco advertisement in the world. We're going to look at the tobacco industry and the porn industry, because the porn industry is taking lessons from the tobacco industry today. He wrote this little tract published back in Europe. They found this, of course, indigenous plant, this leaf tobacco, in the, in the Americas, and brought the uh, plant back to Europe. It had many strange virtues, which are yet unknown. No kidding. 
Okay, and of course then, by 1619, when, when uh, Jamestown's getting underway, they don't even have, it's becoming in such demand already in Europe that they need more workers. So a Dutch ship stops by with some African slaves. Hey, we'll take them. And slavery is fueled for that first century by tobacco. So exploitation of the people smoking it, they didn't even know they were killing them yet, and they're exploiting the slave workers to make it. And again, porn has taken a lesson from that book as well. And of course, this is the 50s. Doctors smoke more cigarettes than any other, more camels than any other cigarette. Real advertisements, by profession, from the 50s. Well, how about this guy, a throat surgeon? Give your throat a vacation? How about a permanent one? <laughs> and you remember the Joe Camel, right? Notice, that's a teenage camel. So they were saying, are you guys advertising to kids? Oh, us tobacco? No, we wouldn't do that. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll come back to it. So what we have now is the Clarence Little phenomenon in the porn industry. What do I mean by that? Briefly, Clarence Little, PhD researcher, Harvard educated, president of the University of Michigan, and basically a pro-tobacco scientist who said tobacco not only is not addictive, but it causes no harm. It's good for your lungs. No cancer. And he was president of the tobacco research industry, a group of doctors who supported tobacco all through the 50s, 60s, 70s. And even into the 70s, Clarence Little, cover of Time magazine, smoking his pipe, said tobacco is harmless. Okay, a doctor. Believe me, trust me, I'm a doctor. Many times you heard that one. Okay. <laughs> And here's this cozy relationship between Clarence Little, the academic, the professor, and industry, right? The Tobacco 7, remember them in front of Henry Waxman's committee? Smoking is not addictive. And they're experts, PhDs, backing them up in 1994. And there's people that still say this. So what they did is they knew this. And this is in 1968. This is internal memos inside the tobacco industry. They knew tobacco was, they had internal memos, yeah, it's causing cancer. What, they didn't say, let's quit selling it, let's quit killing people. They said, gosh, how do we hide this? We have to keep making our billions. We have to keep killing half a million Americans a year and six million people worldwide. So how do we hide it? We create controversy. So they said, we've got to cast doubt on the cause and effect theory of disease and smoking. Controversy, unknowns. And that was in 68, three years after everyone else agreed it causes cancer and put the warning labels on the cigarettes. So then targeting teens, okay? They said, we're not targeting teens. Internal memos from the 70s that said, yep, most people start smoking. This is the tobacco industry, internal memos. Um, the 14 to 24 market, and they'll smoke for 25 years. Most of them start before the age of 18. We need to capture them now. They were saying it. They wanted the kids. Porn industry's doing the same thing. Nicole Prouse, for instance, we'll come back to her, was at UCLA, is not anymore, uh, has started a private company uh, dealing with more uh, sexual excitement kind of things. Um, it's a private company dealing with uh, brain stimulation and sexuality. Uh, but this is basically from her paper, and this paper received wide press in the popular press. Hey, when a paper comes out and says porn's good for you, it's not addictive, it's party time, right? The press loves those papers. She said one possibility, she and her co-authors, is that those with higher sexual sensation seeking, in other words, they're born that way. They're not addicted. It doesn't change, you're just born that way. Use pornography at younger ages and broaden the content of their pornography when sexual partners are not available to them to engage in actual sexual misbehaviors. <laughs> We need younger and younger people watching porn. <coughs> then they can just watch it and they won't have to do it. <coughs> Sounds really good, right? Advertisers need to quit showing cars on TV. People will just watch the pretty cars. <laughs> I mean, it's, re it's remarkable. So the Daily Beast, uh, very pro-pornography, they love these porn studies that Nicole Prouse did. They did an EEG study where they said, wow, based on our EEG studies, it looks like it's not addiction. Um, so, they immediately, this, this is the study, Steele, Staley, Fong, and Krauss published this study in the journal Sexual uh, uh, Socio um, Neuroscience and Psychology. And of course, a Daily Beast and many uh, popular press, piece, uh, press outlets echoed this in the, in the uh, popular press. So I published this piece in the originating journal as a peer-reviewed rebuttal, showing the problems with this. 
And then we published later in Sexual Addiction and Compulsivity, these are both peer-reviewed journals, Bonnie Phillips, Raj and Jill and myself published this other piece looking more extensively at the earlier paper, that Empire's paper, the, the Emperor's New Groove paper. Do you think these made the Daily Beast? No, not at all. And so it's this Clarence Little effect. Krauss and Lay and others are essentially Clarence, Clarence Little. So just to illustrate that, this is Melissa Howard, How, uh, Hill and Howard Levine, uh, former pornography producer, performer, radio talk show, pornography-based radio talk show in Los Angeles. Nicole Prowse, this is a Twitter where she's congratulating her on this. Basically, we're buds, business ABM. This is really good. And this is a, uh, a link to an interview of Nicole Prowse on her show where she's talking about it. And notice that, for instance, she just did another study on, uh, on uh, basically how on, on the penis. And it's a 3D study, and she published in a peer-reviewed journal. I'm not making this up. It's Nicole Prowse. She's also talking about her new company, Liberus, and promoting it. And this, of course, this show is promoting her. Look who's actually sponsoring the show, adultempire.com. Who are they? They're a porn website, porn company. Who are they a subsidiary of? MindGeek, the number one, I'll talk about it, the number one porn company in the world. They own virtually every site or anyone broadcasting on the internet is going to have to work under MindGeek. So here is Nicole Prowse saying porn's not addictive, being promoted by Adult Empire, which is a MindGeek subsidiary. Again, the Clarence Little Effect from tobacco. So then this one as well, this shows, this is a porn, Nicole Prowse to a porn producer. If you need problems, if you have problems with people attacking uh, the porn pornography, let me know. Remember, she wrote this paper in her zoo clothes. Uh, Melissa Hill, to Melissa Hill, a genie story I heard at ABN, Adult Video News. It's the big porn industry meeting every year. So Nicole Prowse was at the ABN meeting, at the meeting with the big pornography industry meeting every year. Again, this Clarence little cozy effect between porn academics and the industry. And then here, this is a porn producer saying, Nicole Prowse, I love it. You're our superhero, Nicole. <laughs> Needless to say, those of us that write rebuttals to her journals are not her superheroes. <laughs> Another, uh, this was a, a paper that, uh, actually a newspaper article. And when we talked, if you remember, about structural changes, we predicted we'll see structural changes in pornography. Some more academics that are a little softer on porn said, we have the best MRI scanners in the world at UCLA. I can promise you, if we scan a pornography user's brain, we won't see any structural differences. 2010, and of course, I'm going to talk about this later. 2014, um, Simmons, Kuhn, and Gallinger out of the Max Planck Institute in Germany just last year, published in the journal JAMA Psychiatry, Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry, found structural changes in the human brain with pornography. We'll talk about that more in a minute. MindGeek, I talked about them earlier. It's basically the monopoly, the porn monopoly of the world. And like the site that is promoting Nicole Prowse, they're all under MindGeek. So these porn professionals will be promoted by MindGeek. Remember this, how billions of options, that's not what it looks like from the owner's side. From MindGeek's side, this is what Jennifer Johnson found. That's MindGeek. These are the billions of people on the outside looking in. So basically, those individual users think they're getting that array field of millions of sites, but it's actually all consolidated under increasingly tight links with mind geeks controlling the center. Very interesting. Goes back to R.J. Reynolds and Morris with tobacco, doesn't it? Those tobacco companies. So addiction represents a pathological but powerful form of learning and memory. Where am I at? That? 16 minutes. 16. So I've got about Nine 10. And a half minutes. About 9 minutes. Okay. So addiction represents a pathological but powerful form of learning and memory. When I say learning and memory, I mean how does it change your brain? We know that it does. Now, I became interested in the brain side. I developed a close friendship with this man, Derek Denton. A wonderful man. He's been on the Nobel Prize Committee. He's just a uh, a remarkable scientist in Australia, and he and I became friends. I had been invited to speak in Australia while there. I had the idea of looking at, basically they study what makes our brains crave things that we need. And one of the most basic cravings is salt. So they have a sheet model, 
and they were looking at what makes these sheep, if you deplete them of salt, their brain absolutely crazy. So what happens in the brain to cause that brain itch, that brain itch to crave salt? And it basically certain DNA transcripts are evoked and woken up and they crank and go into gear and we found out that those same DNA sequences are exactly the same as the DNA sequences that are turned on with cocaine. And that had never been shown. In our paper, uh, we worked at Duke University on that paper, and I was honored to be a member of that uh, team. It was published in the National Academy of Sciences, the PNAS, in 2011. Uh, National Geographic wrote an article about our paper and said basically drugs hijack instinct and need for salt. And I think that's a good description of addiction. It hijacks, it usurps what should be a motivation for us to survive and instead takes over. What happens then are these are brain wires called axons and dendrites. And notice this is unaddicted, this is addicted. These new sprouts represent the brain saying that was real, that felt really good. I don't want to forget that. So it grows a new road, a new brain wire, a new road to another cell so it doesn't forget. And we first saw this with cocaine. Then we saw it with salt craving. And then, yes, we saw it with pictures at all with sex. Animal model looks neuroplasticity, brain change with a powerful reward like sex, just like cocaine. How does that happen? Powerful drugs like Delta Fos B, chemicals, are turned on by DNA in the brain, and they change the brain. And they, in people that are addicted, these are higher than in, physio than in normal physiology, in normal life. That changes the brain structurally as well. And in fact, 20 years ago, we found that violin players, uh, the earlier they start to play, the part of the brain that controls the string hand gets bigger. The more they play, the bigger it gets. The brain, as Zatori said, who did a violin study, the brain is the source of behavior, but in turn is modified by the behaviors it produces. Learning sculpts brain structure. And so this was a violin study, Ebert, Schwenkrist, a violin study, and Durkowski, they took medical students and scanned them before and after three months of studying, the brain got bigger. What happens with addiction? Every study, cocaine or even natural addictions like obesity and sexuality have shown shrinkage in the reward area and changes in the frontal lobes. And the study that I just alluded to earlier, Kuhn's study in JAMA Psychiatry showed the same thing. So here's that Kuhn study, we're going back to it. Brain atrophy in the striatum, which is that nucleus accumbens area, it's the area of the brain where the accumbens is, and it's basically a reward center. And dopamine is a powerful brain reward, and it's very important and wanted. It decreases frontal connectivity. This thinking judgment part of the brain is impaired, and the more hours per week viewed, the more the changes in the brain, the more structural changes. And then this, we also predicted metabolic changes. Cambridge University, last year, published in PLUS One, looking at metabolic studies. So we talked about structural, what's metabolic? You show a person with cocaine, a line of cocaine, and the reward center of their brain lights up like a Christmas tree. Normal person means nothing. So this is the brain of an unaddicted person, brain of cocaine. Well, cocaine looks like this, this is porn. It looks just like cocaine. This is the Boone study, and basically she found that, and this is the second study she did on it, that these studies together provide support for an incentive motivation theory of addiction. So they're talking about addiction and brain change. Nicholas Tinbergen, he found that if you paint bird eggs, he received the Nobel Prize for describing this, that if you paint bird eggs, plaster eggs, uh, and the bird tries to, that the, the birds will normally try to nest the plaster eggs and they will prefer plaster eggs in preference to their eggs if the, bur if the plaster eggs are bigger and brighter. And he called that a supernormal stimulus. Then he took butterfly wings, and he found out that male butterflies, when they're confronted with plastic false female butterfly wings, they ignore real females and try to mount and make the, pla the paper cardboard fake female butterfly wings. And that's called a supernormal stimulus. And pornography is that. I published this paper and the same journal that Nicole Prowse published her paper as well, talking about that. 3D optics, computer ectoskeletons. These are bragging, these are businesses saying, we're not going to need women anymore, we're going to have haptic technology, and people can just have sex with computers. In fact, virtual reality porn will make 2D porn completely obsolete. Uh, so, supernormal satisfaction. So you have how many? Four, three and a half. 
So he, they've got three and a half for me here. So, <laughs> so um, in Japan, um, the pressing need to find a partner has been alleviated by the ubiquity of porn, sex toys, virtual sex on bedroom computers. Um, so it's really having an effect. Naomi Wolf, the feminist, said the same thing. She said, not, she described the supernormal stimulus. For the first time in human history, the image's power and alert supplanted that of real naked women today. Real naked women are just bad porn. Mirror systems. Um, so mirror systems are where our brain projects into what we're seeing, and we become emotionally what we're watching, and porn evokes that. It puts the person in the movie. Bill Margold said, I want to show violence against women, and I edited his words here. Um, violent uh, ejaculation to the face, which is almost all porn movies end with this today. We try to inundate the world with orgasms in the face. So he's, his motivation, his mirror systems, when a 14-year-old Johnny watches it, Bill is his emotional teacher. And yes, it is increasing rape. If you want to talk more about this, Dad, they say porn makes rape go down. It doesn't. Corey Young's Iowa Law Review, if you want to get a picture of this title, I'll give you the reference later, it doesn't. Lexington Steel. I find myself not unlike the slaves of 400 years ago. I trade my own flesh for monetary compensation and sell the flesh of others for the same. Steve Hirsch, Bones Vivid, $100 million a year making vivid porn films. You want your daughter to be in Vivid, Steve? No, he said, I think I would send her to medical school instead. Just like William Webb, former CEO for Philip Morris Tobacco, you want your son to smoke? No, I don't want my son to smoke. I don't think it's healthy. Them. They want your daughters and they want your sons so they can fly in their private jets. Now they're 19, they're hookers, they don't care. This is Jim Powers' pornography. They're a throwaway commodity in a throwaway world. Alan Payton, it's exploitation. Such development has only one true name. It's exploitation when we use other people instead of ourselves. So between the stimulus and response, there's a space, and that space is our power to choose our response. And our response lies our growth and our freedom. Victor Frankl, man searching meaning. So, but in other words, we're a brain like Victor Frankl. We have emotion. And I believe we are more than just the stimulus response. An amoeba eating a paramecium. It doesn't think, it just eats. It's a stimulus response. That is the porn view of sex. We're not humans anymore. We don't have a brain. Men are brutes, women are pieces of meat. I, I'm gonna, I'll uh, skip that uh, story. Cicero, 2,000 years ago, if emotion be eliminated, what difference is there? I, not, I say not between a man and a brute, but between a man and a rock, or the trunk of a tree, or any inanimate object. So really, it's about emotion in the end. Um, my parents were married for 50 years. This, this uh, picture actually was right before they married, a month or two before. Um, you know, dad would go into med school, mom worked to support him in med school, then he supported her for years. And I really believe that rather than the amoeba view, the porn view of sex, I believe it's more about human emotion, about human love. I believe that we are better than that. I believe we can do better than that. Thank you. There's a couple of choice pieces of real estate on the floor here for those of you who want to sit down. We can put a few over here and a few over there if you're looking my name is Pat Truman. You may have heard the introduction, and uh, when I heard it, it reminded me of uh, an introduction I got when I was with the Justice Department one day after work. I was asked to speak to a big Catholic audience of women in Baltimore, and uh, so Baltimore is a little way from Washington, D.C. I decided well, I could go ahead and do that. And uh, you got that going. And uh, so I went up after work, and the lady who was going to introduce me was going through my bio of all the cases. She wanted to make sure she got the names right and everything. And I said to her, look, I've got small children at home, need to get home and uh, put them to bed, do their homework, etc." So just make this introduction as brief as possible. So when she introduced me, she said, our speaker tonight is from the United States Department of Justice, Patrick Truman. No man in America is more familiar with pornography than Mr. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm now with the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. You can see I've had my hair cut since this picture was taken. Uh, we have a very highly intelligent board of directors, uh, very high IQ, and when Dr. Donald Pilkey 
joined our board of directors two years ago, the average IQ of the board doubled, as you can see from his presentation. Uh, people ask me all the time, what are you talking about when you're talking about pornography? I was in another presentation where our executive director was speaking about this topic uh, this week at the Congress. And uh, when it got over, someone said, what do you mean by pornography? And there was a lot of heads going up and down. This is not a legal definition. This is my own definition. Nudity or sex acts erotically depicted, intended to excite. So when I use the word pornography, that's what I'm talking about. You get people saying, well, this is pornography or that's pornography. I'm talking about nudity or sex acts erotically depicted, intended to excite. And what I know for certain after 30 years in working on the issue of pornography is that the more hardcore pornography you have in society, actually you could say the more pornography, the more pornography you have in society, the more you'll have promiscuity, addiction, prostitution, trafficking, child pornography, sex abuse. It, this is what we call the porn triangle. If you reduce this base, which is por hardcore pornography, everything else is reduced right on up the line. And when I was first with the Department of Justice, one of the things I did, there were all these people from around the country writing us, urging us on to prosecute these big pornographers in the country, and I read a lot of those 100,000 letters that were sent to us. So many people wrote to us of how they lost their son to pornography, how they lost their husband to pornography. Husbands wrote to us from jail saying that they had molested their own daughter, and it all started with Playboy magazine, and it's this uh, continuation, this need for harder and more deviant material, the addiction that goes on, they demand more material, and uh, as, as the porn triangle indicates, they move on up and act up. <clears throat> I won't go through all the harms that are uh, included. Uh, we'll talk about some as I go along here. But I want to highlight this one. It increases the demand for child pornography. You don't hear that very often. When I left the Justice Department 20 years ago, Child pornography was virtually wiped out in America. And the internet started to be popularized right after that. Now, what happened in the internet? Did we suddenly uh, empower pedophiles and they're all of a sudden looking for child pornography? Not at all. So much of the child pornography that you find uh, that people are looking for online are looked for by <coughs> men, women, and even children who begin by looking at adult pornography. But the brain, as Dr. Hilton points out, always wants something new, something harder, something more deviant. And if we were to draw a graph of what the child pornography problem in America looks like, 20 years ago it was this base, and now it's spiked up just like this. Adult pornography is responsible for much of it. We like to use this spider web talking about the connection of sexually exploitive behaviors. Here's porn right here. Here's prostitution. What do you think the percentage of men who visit a prostituted women, what do you think the percentage is of them looking at pornography? Would you need a study to say it's 100%? Uh, but those who don't look at pornography, who make sure that they, they don't let that into their brains, what percentage of them do you think are walking off to prostitutes? Very little. It's the same with sex trafficking. There's no such thing as prostitution without sex trafficking. Don't think of that as two different things. Every strip club in America has prostitution, and every strip club in America, one way or another, you'll find has sexual trafficking. Child sex abuse, child porn, it's all interrelated. Dr. Hilton talked about the public health crisis of pornography, and we like to use this language because it isn't just this moral problem that a family down the street has. No, it's far beyond that. Everybody in this family, in this room, has someone in their family, or maybe yourself, or someone. It's all uh, such a great problem today that it's now a public health crisis. There's a couple studies that indicate that first exposure to uh, pornography is about 11, 12 years of age. Oftentimes it's much uh, worse than that. We had a woman call us here two years ago in the summer to say, my six-year-old daughter looks for pornography or sexual images every place she is, every chance she gets. She was shown pornography in daycare by someone. What kind of a country have we built where six-year-olds are demanding to see pornography? 
Kids are getting a daily dose of pornography. These are some of the statistics that are out there. By the time these kids are adults, virtually all of them have seen pornography. Now, I hope that you know, many of them don't. They just look at it once and move away, but that, in fact, isn't what we know about kids. That is such a stimulus to the brain, such, and it creates such a desire. Uh, they want to move on beyond that and look again and again and again. And it is now so very available that they'll do that. Where do kids get pornography? This is so important to understand. National Center for Missing and Exploited Children says 79% of the kids get it at home. Now, think about that. I asked a uh, the president of a major filtering company here uh, in Utah a couple of years ago, what percentages of the homes in America are properly protected from pornography, getting pornography uh, by filtering, etc.? And he said about 5%, about 5%. And you can do this little test I'm going to give you. It's a one-question test. How many internet-connected devices, mom and dad, do you have in your home? And if you return husband and wife to each other and ask that question, you'd get a different answer. You probably couldn't add them up, but you think your home is protected. And then what about that laptop that your husband no longer uses? He wanted a faster, bigger laptop. The old one's in the basement. You know, the one that gets internet, and the kids know that, and they're getting internet pornography there. What about mom's cell phone? Oh, I keep it with me all the time. Yeah, but you take a nap once in a while. You go to the store, you forget it once in a while, and those kids know how to get pornography on their phone. 79% right at home. What do kids do when they look at pornography? They want to copy it. They want to do what they're seeing in pornography. And the worst thing is kids today are becoming pornographers. What is sexting? That's when you're taking pictures of yourself or your friends or trading pictures of your classmates uh, or getting pictures off the internet and sending it to others. <clears throat> but this is what it is for high school kids, and it's a popular pastime for high school kids. It's children producing and distributing child pornography. This is a problem in schools around the country. This is a problem in legislatures all around the country are dealing with. Children are taking pictures. They might be 17 years old or 15 years old, taking pictures of their classmates the same age. That is child pornography. First offense on the federal level will get you a minimum of five years in jail. What do you do about Johnny who's 15 years old and he has a collection of a third of the girls in his class? And this happens. And why do kids do it? This is a survey here, these questions. That, that, uh, it was a multiple issue survey in one uh, <coughs> girls magazine uh, asking kids why they get involved, why, asking the girls, why do you get involved in sexting? Do you do it to get attention? 80% said yes. What's wrong with the kids that are growing up today that 80% of them think that the giving of their most personal self will get them attention? Two thirds hope to be cool. 56% or 9% want to be like the popular girl. 54% want to find a boyfriend. Uh, there's apps and whatnot that they're using today. <coughs> Pornography equals violence. Dr. Anna Burgess and her team studied the most popular uh, 50 uh, porn films in America a couple years ago, and they realized, they found that 88.2% of the images uh, of the scenes, 88% of the scenes contain images of violence. And it's violence against women. Now, why does the porn industry <coughs> produce so much violence in, and sex in their movies? Well, they'll tell you it's not them. They don't do it because they think this is a good idea. This is what people are demanding. I mean, when a man goes on the computer or a woman goes on the computer and looks at topless women or whatever for a while, they want something different right away. And, it's, and it, they keep it escalating to the point where our culture is demanding sex and violence. So that in the most popular films, that's what they're given. 80% of the scenes depicts violence against women. Now, let me ask you this, with such popular, with such a high percentage of young people engaging in or consuming pornography, and the studies show college students, it's, it's almost everyone. It's better than 80, uh, it's like 82 or 84 percent. What kind of a nation, what kind of a future do you have when you have such high numbers of young men enjoying sex 
mixed with violence against women. We don't know the answer. We have no roadmap to their future. But what we know is that they will be running our country in just a few short years. Dr. Sharon Cooper, who is a pediatric uh, a pediatrician and a, a medical professor, says that porn normalizes sexual harm. This is true for adults. And the studies all show how the, your mind changes in terms of what you believe. But it's especially true for children. I don't mean to take the role of a uh, neurosurgeon here, but uh, prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that is apparently, according to Dr. Cooper, so impacted. And she says that prefrontal cortex has to develop well, and it doesn't develop fully until they're in their early 20s, I understand. But that's the home of good judgment, common sense, impulse control, and emotion. We have people calling us all the time, don't know what happened to my son. A woman came up to me at a conference, my 11 year old son was given a Laptop, I'm not a laptop, but iPad by the school. And all the kids have it. And at 11, she said he changed immediately. His judgment, his activities, etc., all changed. How much time? 12 minutes. Oh, hasn't done too well. Here's something that our society hardly even considers the fact that this issue of children as sexual offenders. There's a British study showing that at least in one year, they discovered 4,500 uh, children who are sexual offenders, some as young as five years of age. Now that's a country of 62 million. We're a country of 300 million. Do you think things are different there than here? This is a greatly underreported crime. Are you going to report your 12-year-old boy for molesting your 7-year-old daughter? No, but it is a crime in our society. Of the ones that they studied, they could find 4,500. Uh, we hear about this all the time. Parents write us, law enforcement officers talk to us about it. What is happening to our young people? What is the effect on boys? Boys gain from pornography a sense of sexual entitlement. Sexual <laughs> entitlement. They're looking at all these images. They see the girls smiling in pornography. They must enjoy it. This is how they learn to interact with the girls. And the peer pressure on girls to look at pornography is very great. Much of that comes from the boys and what they require because they have a sense of sexual entitlement. We used to always say when I was at the Justice Department that females are not interested in pornography. The interest of women or girls in pornography is a 20 year, has a 20 year history. 20 years ago, they weren't interested. Women are just built differently. Men. They're not as you know. But boys are demanding sex, and the peer pressure is very great, and girls are getting involved in it. Dr. Uh, Marianne Layden, who's also on our board of directors, says that what pornography does is develop permission giving beliefs in the consumers. They think they have permission to do what they saw on that screen. <clears throat> Dr. Layden is currently in the midst of research. Uh, at a major northeastern university, one you've heard about, the powerhouse school. And I'm not allowed to, name, to put the name out yet until she releases her study. But one of the survey questions of the boys on campus, this is 19 to 22 years of age, is have you ever been to a prostitute? Or do you intend to go? 25% of the boys said yes. Why is that? Porn breaks down the inhibition of an individual. Prostitution is a taboo, it still is a taboo in society. Breaking that, I mean, if you knew your next door neighbor was engaged with prostitution, that would be a big thing. But for college kids, prostitution is nothing. And I've been involved in child pornography investigation in New York City, 2 a.m., the meat market district, the old meat market district, where the pimps bring out the child prostitutes, and they're not prepubescent. You know, they're 15, 16, 17-year-old kids. And we saw it was lined up, kids in cars, waiting to have sex with these prostitutes. Where do these kids come from? Colleges, nearby. Corn breaks down their inhibition. <clears throat> I love this little graphic here, actor Tony Danza. If you've been watching pornography since you were 11 years old, do I really want you marrying my daughter? You know, uh, there was an article in Psychology Today a few years ago, and I've seen it elsewhere, about something they call porn-induced sexual dysfunction. 
It's the Viagra problem that uh, they've talked about for kids in their mid-20s, at the age they should be marrying. But their sexual template has been developed with the massive consumption of pornography, followed by masturbation, and by the time they're in their mid-20s, they can't think about getting married. That's not what's exciting to them. And uh, if they were to get married, it wouldn't end well. Well, it's not just pornography, according to that definition I provided earlier. Hollywood plays a big role in all of this as well. What is Hollywood to kids today? Often it's their parent, their teacher, and their God. Hollywood is in the lives of your kids day in, day out, 24-7. I've had parents tell me, I don't know what happened to my daughter engaged in all that terrible sexual activity. I gave her the sex talk when she was young. Yeah, you gave her the sex talk one time, and Hollywood gave her that sex talk multiple times a day on multiple media. If she got it on the television that you provided your daughter, on the laptop, on the music, etc., etc. Television reaches children at a younger age and for more time than any other socializing institution except what? Except for the family and what's happened to the American family. It is breaking up. And that's beyond dispute. I won't go into it because I know I'm finally probably running close to the time. Seven. Seven. Well, there are many other influences on children. They walk into the supermarket with you. They are at the counter, checkout counter, and there's Cosmopolitan magazine with a nearly naked woman blaring uh, sex comments on the cover of that and all the other magazines, you know, I don't know the names of all of them, but just the mainstream ones that are in there. There's video games, there's a study of video games, that the sexualized images in those video games, 60% of them are sexualized images of girls, 1% of the boys. Now, video games today can be interactive, that is, they're hooked up to the internet, and you can get off that live sex act, depending on where your kids are going. You can get uh, in some of these games where the reward for winning the video game is having sex with a prostitute there. <clears throat> but do parents know this? They're not looking at those video games. They give them to their kids. And the kids, if they got that from their parent, isn't that a permission-giving belief? They're seeing pornography, got it from mom and dad. Music is the celebration today of sexual exploitation in a lot of your rap music and other, you know that. The American Psychological Task Force in 2007 studied the effect of our sexualized society on girls. And what they pointed out is that it's not enough anymore for a girl to be a straight A student or a good student or a good athlete or just a good kid. If she doesn't see herself as a sexual being, as sexy, she doesn't consider that she lives up in our society. That's the society that we built for them. They call that sexual self-identification. Dr. Sharon Lamb, who is a member of, was a member of that task force, was with Dr. Hilton and me and others in a group that met a year ago this past April at the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children where we talked about all these issues. And in her presentation, she said, we are dumbing down girls. What she said is that if a girl wants to get attention and what girl doesn't, what young girl doesn't, uh, it takes time to get attention uh, with music or with uh, learning a, a sport, uh, etc. But if you want to get attention, all you have to do is dress like a slut and walk out the front door to the mall and you'll get all the attention you need. That's just five minutes? Okay. <clears throat> she says we're developing two types of girls in our society today. One of the boys and one for the boys. Dr. Gail Dines, who was also at that meeting, said that for a girl, to, a girl today must be sexually active or be invisible. That's the choice that our sexualized society gives that girl. And she asked, what 14-year-old girl wants to be invisible? In our, sexualized, in our sexualized society, we are breeding boys to be predators and girls to be victims. I want to encourage you to do something about that, to be part of this movement that has started, and it is a very great movement, to end sexual exploitation in our society. This is our website, endsexualexploitation.org. That's our web 
about the email address right there. Yeah. What is a National Center on Sexual Exploitation? We are an activist group. We connect you to the corporations and others that are involved in sexual exploitation so that you can end it. You know? One of the things we want to do is get our United States Department of Justice once again to do what I was doing when I was there and had the privilege of doing prosecuting our federal laws. Do you know that it's against federal law to distribute hardcore pornography on the internet? Five-year penalty. Imagine that. All over the internet, no one's prosecuting. It's a violation of federal law to distribute hardcore pornography on cable or satellite television. Comcast, Verizon, they all do it. Violation of federal law to distribute it in a hotel. Hardcore pornography. Many hotels do that. Those laws need to be enforced. They aren't enforced because the Attorney General of the United States says no. That person is on the side of the pornographers, not on your side. One of the things we've also done is we've established a law center. Back there, raise your hand, is our executive director of the law center, Danny. Uh, and so we're trying to help states get their laws enforced or perfect their laws. We put out the dirty dozen list every year. And over there on that table, you can pick up a copy of it and you can go to our website. But we get results with this. Because, for example, Hilton Hotels is on that list. And we uh, build a website with all the uh, email addresses of the top executives of, for example, Hilton Hotels. It was a two-year campaign. This July, Hilton Hotels says we run off the dirty desert. We're getting rid of pornography in every hotel uh, that's a Hilton brand all across the world. Hyatt Hotel told us they'll do the same just recently. Others on this list because of that concentration of citizen action, just sending them an email, making a phone call, makes it happen. We also have a wonderful program coming to your town, put up billboards, get things going. This is our hotel project. We ask people to sign a pledge. The pledge is on that table. That you will not stay at a hotel that has porn. And uh, there are plenty of hotels that don't. <clears throat> we have a major program against Cosmopolitan Magazine just recently in this last year. We've got Walmart and uh, more than 4,500 other stores across America to put Cosmopolitan behind blinders. Cosmopolitan is a porn magazine without the Playboy type pictures. What can you do today? Go to our Facebook page if you want, Facebook slash Porn Arms. Uh, join that because every day we've got an activist thing you can do. Uh, join the Dirty Dozen list, our Cosmo program. I want to end by saying there's really hope. I know many of you, as I said earlier, you may be dealing with this, you know someone's dealing with this. There's never been more hope to get people out of that uh, terrible place they are uh, addicted or involved with pornography. There's a number of programs you can get on our website. Help is on the way. Here's our main website, nsexualexploitation.org slash resources. In the resources section, whatever your difficulty is, you, you'll find help. And the last thing I want to say is you do not have to accept sexual exploitation in your family, in your society. The quest for safe families and decent communities is always just beginning. You are not too late for that. Thank you. background. So I have a background in relationships and marriage, healthy relationship formation, and, and I want to talk about two main things today. Building off a lot of great ideas, I want to thank my co-presenters with some just really excellent material. I'm going to focus a little bit on our youth specifically, talking particularly about teenagers and young adults, and then I also want to focus on the relational cost of pornography. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is um, and share some data with you about several projects and, and data collection projects that I'm involved with to give you some actual numbers about what some of those costs might be. Now, real quick, let's talk a little bit about why we might want to focus on our youth. Obviously, pornography consumption is rapidly increasing across all segments of our society because of the internet, because of the changes that, that Don was talking about. But particularly in our youth population, this is one of the populations we're talking about, adolescents and young adults, we're seeing 
a lot of increased use of granularity. This is the generation now that has been raised since birth with their iPhones and tablets and internet connectivity. They've never known anything different. And so this is the group that has kind of grown up with pornography all around them. Now youth in particular is a concern for several specific reasons. One is early exposure. We know regardless of what kind of sexuality we're talking about, whether it's actual sexual behavior or pornography, early exposure has risks both in young adulthood and childhood and later in life. Again, that's regardless of if it's pornography, earlier sexual initiation, early masturbation, tons of research, social science research out there suggesting that's going to have harmful effects later in life. Pornography is no different. The other issue is this escalating usage. Again, I'll show you some numbers that suggest that particularly in our youth populations, pornography use is skyrocketing. Um, it's become what I'm going to talk about is normalized, which means it's just what everyone does in this particular population. Now, from a, a, a psychological in relationship perspective, the added concern here has to do with when we think about the human life course, when we think about development, when we think about children, when we think about all of us, we talk about our youth as a foundational part of life. Regardless of whatever part of life we're talking about, we know that part of what makes you you is your childhood experiences. For most of us, that's the experiences we had in our families. We get experiences as children with our families, with our peers. That's the foundation of who we are. As we grow up, we get into young adulthood, and we often talk about young adulthood about experimenting. Now, we don't use experimenting as a dirty word. There can be unhealthy experimentation with sex and drugs, but you can also have healthy experimentation with public speaking, with advocacy groups, with volunteering. That can be a form of putting myself out there and experimenting with different causes. That's what we do in young adulthood to build off of that foundation. And as we build off of that, we eventually start to develop who will we become as an adult? What are going to be our behavioral patterns? What kind of relationships am I going to have in my family as an adult? It builds off of those childhood and young adult experiences. So the question then becomes, as pornography becomes more and more prevalent among our youth, starts to become part of both the childhood experiences and the young adult experimentation, what is that going to have implications for as adults? What is that going to change about our adulthood habits? Let me give you just a, a brief sense of, of what this is looking like with our youth. And I'm going to focus in on 18-year-olds and some data I collected. For about 300, just 18-year-olds. And 18 is a great age to look at because it's right in that apex of kind of youth. It's right at the end of adolescence, right at the beginning of young adulthood, when many of these youth are graduating high school, going on to college, going on to start maybe their careers. What does pornography look like at that particular time? Now this is going to be some data specifically looking at just pornography use in the last year. So not ever using it, but have you been using pornography in the last year broken down by gender? First for men, that green bar is the never. The yellow one, gold one, is monthly use. And the red-orange one is weekly use. And you can see there is still a segment of men at 18 that are not using pornography, but it's not the biggest group. By far the biggest group, not by far, but you put the monthly and weekly group together, it is much larger than the number group. For women, we still see a very big gender difference here. And I want you to start to think about what this would mean as these people try to get married um, you know, in, in five or 10 years. Um, but most women at 18 are not reporting regular use in the last year. If you want to put some specific numbers in it, at 18, 70% of men are using pornography either weekly or monthly in the last year. Seven, almost two uh, or three-fourths of these 18-year-old men. Women, 18%. Again, a very big gender difference, but about a fifth of women are using weekly or monthly. And that percent, by the way, has been increasing fairly dramatically um, in the last decade or so. It used to be a lot closer to 2 or 3%. What about attitudes? How are these 18-year-olds thinking about pornography? Well, we ask them the question, do you agree that pornography is an acceptable way to express your sexuality. Do you think it's okay? Again, starting with the men, you can see the vast majority of men are neutral. They don't have a super strong opinion that pornography is really good or beneficial, but they also definitely don't have a perspective that it's really harmful either. They're right in the middle. It's just part of what their life is like. It's just something that's there. It's something that's not going to hurt me. It's not going to help me. It's just part of my life. Women, again, a little bit of a gender difference, but you'll notice it's not as extreme with the attitude. The largest group of women is still neutral. For both men and women, it's the neutral category. If you break this into any amount of agreement, 
you've got about 60% of your men at 18 that agree that pornography is an acceptable way to express sexuality. About 35%, a little over a third of these 18-year-old women are saying the same thing. Now that's only part of the story. What happens if you combine this and look at what about our youth that are either using or accepting the pornography? And then you get something pretty striking. 93 points in, almost 94% of 18-year-old men that we surveyed either were using pornography or agreed that it was an acceptable thing to do. Almost all of them, 93.7%. Almost 60% of the girls, women at 18, were either using pornography regularly or agreed or thought it was acceptable, right? Almost, again, two-thirds of women. You can see just in these numbers, which are pretty reflective of what we're starting to see, that pornography has become a very normal part of youth experience. Whether they're using, whether they accept it, it's part of their life for most of these youth. Now, back to the idea of social costs. We've been talking about a lot of social costs in this discussion. We've been talking about individual costs, community costs, societal costs, familiar costs. Again, I want to focus on relational costs. Sometimes this gets lost in the mix. We don't talk as much about what is the relational cost. We tend to focus a lot on the individual, a lot on the uh, potential addictive behaviors of, re of relationship. And all of these costs are certainly there. Again, on the individual, as is, is Don talked about, there can be brain chemistry issues and costs at the individual level. Um, there's attachment issues. There's issues of addiction with pornography. Those are all individual costs. At the community and societal level, there's issues of sex trade. There's issues of our social values just as a country, as a society, that are changing as pornography becomes more and more common. At the family level, there's also effects on the family in terms of how we're able to educate, and if we're able to educate our parents, as was spoken about. Are parents even aware of the sexual education their kids are getting? Are they able to properly communicate with their kids? These are all very real social costs. On the relational side, though, again, the one that sometimes we don't talk as much about is how does pornography affect my ability to form and maintain healthy relationships? in healthy marriages. How does it affect my marriage? How does it affect, as I'll talk to you about, what we call sexual scripts. That's what I want to focus on, particularly in how that starts to affect our youth, again, both in adolescence and in adulthood. So the relational costs of pornography, what are they? There's both short-term and long-term effects. On the short term, we have an issue of shifting sexual scripts. And for those of you who are not familiar with the idea of a sexual script, the idea is that all of us have an expectation or script about what sex is supposed to be. What is intimacy supposed to be like? All of us have those expectations. All of us have those, all of us have those ideas in our head about what intimacy is supposed to be. We know that pornography changes what those scripts are. It changes how we think about intimacy and sexuality in our relationships, oftentimes in negative ways. The reason it does that is because of what I call triple ends of pornography. That for 90 plus, if not all of pornography, what you're looking at when people are viewing that is non-normative people doing non-normative sexual behaviors in a non-normative context. And as I view that material over and over and over again, it's going to start to change how I think about intimacy in general. To give you a little bit of a visual of this, is that on the one hand, we would hope, and I would hope as a sexuality researcher who studies relationships, that we want people to have a healthy view and script about sexual intimacy. That sexual intimacy is about connecting with another human being whether that's on a physical level, an emotional level, or even a spiritual level. But that's what intimacy is for me. That's what sex can be in my relationships, is this connection and, and focus on another person. When people hold those kinds of scripts, that's going to lead to certain types of intimacy behaviors, behaviors that are focused on my partner, that are engaged with my partner, that are empathetic, that are enthusiastic, that are building us together and building us up as a couple and are not just about me. Again, pornography changes those scripts. Now, my scripts and beliefs about intimacy are more about my sexual needs. They're more about what I want, what the partner who I believe should be sexually available with me, and most likely, particularly if I'm a male, is going to be a submissive partner to me. And those expectations and those scripts are going to lead to very different types of sexual behaviors, behaviors that are more individualistic, more frustrated with what my partner is not doing. Um, more selfish intimacy in our relationships. That's the kind of short-term relational effect that pornography can have. Now there's also a long-term effect. As I'll show you some data on this, we know that marriages 
are affected by pornography, and not just when pornography is happening in the marriage, as I'll show you in just a few minutes. Marriage can be affected even as early as 20, 18, 15, early on in a youth, in a youth life, as they start to change these views of intimacy, that has a potential impact on their marriage, even if that marriage is 10, 20, 30 years down the line. Now, let me share just a little bit of additional data on marriage itself as we're talking about the relational cost, and then we'll go back to the youth. This is data that I gathered from almost 8,000 married couples in the United States, looking at relationship characteristics, looking at pornography use. Um, and one thing, first of all, I want to point out before you, I show you some of the actual relational impacts and outcomes with these couples, is just to again point out that there's still a very significant gender gap in pornography, even in adulthood. This is not just a youth effect where teenage boys and young adult boys are viewing pornography much more than women. It's something that we see continue into marriages. In the data that we have, we looked at, again, who was using pornography never, who was using it monthly, weekly, or daily, and this was the trend line that we saw for men. Um, you can see that once we do get to marriage, the, the highest percentage is men that are not using pornography, but there's still a significant percent, almost 40% of married men were using pornography on a monthly basis. Almost 20%, a little less than a quarter of married men were using pornography weekly, and then a fairly small were using it on a daily basis. Again, though, when we track the women, we see a very significantly different pattern. Now, almost 80% of married women were not using porn at all. Uh, about 30% using monthly, and then almost none were using weekly or daily. Again, to pretend that this is not going to cause relational effects in these marriages is silly. Of course this is going to change the dynamics of that relationship, particularly among these men as they start to change what intimacy and sex means for them in their marriage. And we see that impact. Now oftentimes, uh, distractors and those that uh, uh, attack this kind of research say, well, yeah, sure, you can show that there's some stability changes and there's some satisfaction changes or communication patterns, but that predates the pornography. That, that predates what was happening. The bad relationships is driving those guys to, to porn. And a lot of sex therapists, um, I present to a lot of sexuality conferences with a lot of the top sex educators in the country, and they regularly make the claim that porn can be good for a marriage, particularly in the bedroom, that we should be able to show or, or suggest to couples that they use pornography in the bedroom, that's going to increase their sexual satisfaction. That's going to increase the, the positivity in the bedroom. And so I always like to point out and say, okay, well, let's actually test it. Let's see what <coughs> pornography does to sexual satisfaction in America. And we see some interesting things. In this same particular data set, this is about 3,000 married couples, we asked them, are you satisfied with different aspects of the intimacy in your marriage? Specifically, we asked them about foreplay. Are you satisfied with the amount of foreplay in your marriage? And we split that then by those that were not using pornography, and those couples where at least one of the partners was doing pornography. And lo and behold, we saw a pretty significant difference. That the users, which was the green bar here, were reporting significantly lower satisfaction with the amount of foreplay in their marriage. We asked them about their satisfaction with the frequency of sex. Again, the same thing. Significant, they were dropping almost an entire point on our scale, the porn users significantly lower satisfaction in their marriages with the frequency of sex. And again, this makes sense to us. What am I seeing in pornography? I'm seeing an available partner that's willing to have sex any time that I want. I'm seeing all these different behaviors that now I want to, and it doesn't matter if my partner wants to or not. That's going to start to affect my satisfaction. That's going to start to affect my marriage. And we know as the satisfaction with intimacy goes down, that will start to have an effect on the communication, conflict, and stability of that particular marriage. Now, that's still the short-term effect though. That's still what's happening in that actual marriage. Let's go back to kids. Let's go back to adolescents and young adulthood and talk about what is the relational effect for them. Again, in a culture, as I showed you, that is regularly viewing pornography, particularly for the boys and men, um, and regularly accepting that this is not doing any harm. This is not a bad thing. This is fine, this is what everyone is doing. How is that affecting their relationship? What is the relational cost for those youth? Again, we have to go back to the developmental model of the life course, that these youth, whether they're their they're teenage years or young adulthood, are in a very foundational, very important part of their life. And one of the things that's developing during this time is their relationship development. They're going through a very important part and phase of their life where they're learning how to be in relationships. 
you want to think about this in terms of the life course of a family, many of these youth are moving from their family of origin with their parents and siblings towards their family of procreation. And they're in this kind of in-between time. When I'm, when I'm leaving my family and I'm starting to date and I'm hopefully, and still for most people, regardless of their background and religion, most people are still going to get married in this country towards that family of procreation. How is pornography affecting that particular process? Again, back to the foundational idea. All of us started to learn about relationships in our family. We looked at our parents, we looked at our peers. Uh, I'm doing a study right now, we're finding one of the biggest influences on young adults is their friends' parents. And they listened to their friends talk about their parents and that affected how they thought about relationships. So we get these experiences in our family that form, form the foundation of everything we're gonna do relationally in our life. Then we become teenagers. And we start to explore intimacy with another person. This is the high school, middle school romance. We start to hold hands. Maybe we have our first kiss. We start to explore with intimacy, and those experiences are powerful. We then get to young adulthood, and we start to now experiment with commitment. I start to have maybe my first long-term committed relationship. I maybe start to have my first significant breakup. What is that like for me? Again, I'm starting to develop and form this foundation that for most of us still, again, is going to end then with some sort of long-term commitment. For most of us, that's still marriage. And that marital relationship is built on the top of all of these other foundations. What happened in my family, what happened as a teenager, what happened as a young adult, my marriage is based on all of these things that came before. Now, it's very difficult to track this entire process for one person. It's a lot of money, it's a very significant long study. One thing we know, though, that helps us understand this process, particularly as we look from building from a family relationship to an eventual marriage, is marital beliefs, how people think about marriage. And we know that how people think about marriage is one of the driving forces that puts people through certain trajectories. When we want to know who's going to marry and who's not, what kind of marriages are they going to have, we can actually start to look at how they think about marriage as a young adult and teenager, and that actually tells us a lot about where they're going to end up later in life. And it's those marital beliefs that are very much being formed through this process. These experiences that we're getting through our childhood and through our youth are changing how we think about marriage. Again, then, how does pornography affect this process? How does pornography then potentially impact how our youth are thinking about marriage? Something that was mentioned before. Do we actually see evidence that pornography users and youth are not just struggling with the brain chemistry changes, issues with addiction, etc., issues with changing scripts, are they actually changing how they think about long-term marriages in condemn? Let's look at that. First off, and this is from another study that I did of young adults, 20 to 25, who are unmarried, and we looked at their sexual behaviors and we looked at how they thought about marriage, and again we looked at did we see differences between these young adults who were using pornography and those that were not, those that were still abstaining in some way from pornography. And one of the questions we asked them is, do you even want to be married now? 20 to 25, a little bit earlier than the national average, that national average of marriage is about 27, 28, but do you want to get married now? Again, separating by gender, because we still see those big gender differences, and then looking at the porn users and the non-porn users. For the men, you can see that as we look at the non-porn users to the porn users, there is a significant jump in that blue line, which is the ones that disagree. I don't want to get married. Among the porn users, that's a significantly higher percent that are saying, no, I don't want to get married now. Among the women, we see the same jump. Not quite as drastic as the men, but the percentage still increases among the pornography users for female. Significantly more of these men and women that are using pornography are actually saying, I don't want to be married now. So now you have some data for that. This is actually the smallest effect that we saw in our study, was this particular question. When we asked them about this question, when do you expect to get married? So we asked them, okay, so you're not married, you're in your early 20s, when do you expect to get married? Here is your non-porn men and women. About 25 is what they said. That's about when they expect to get married. A couple years later, when we looked at the porn users, it skyrocketed. The men jumped almost three years in their expected age of marriage. The women, again, not quite as much. They jumped about a year and a half. A significant change in where they were putting marriage in their life. 
Then we ask them, do you agree that there's more advantages to being single than being married? Do you think it's better to be a single person than a married person? Again, the non-porn users didn't really agree with that very much. When we looked at our porn users, skyrocket. Again, for men and for women. The men, porn users, almost 50% of them then were agreeing that it's more advantageous to be single than to be married. Across everything we saw, we started to see significant shifts in how these youth were thinking about marriage based on their pornography history. So what does this mean? It means that we're seeing evidence now that among our youth, pornography use is significantly tied to a desire to delay marriage and a devaluing of marriage generally. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot, both short-term and long-term again. I've done several studies that have shown that when youth start to delay marriage, when they start to think negatively about marriage, it starts to affect them adversely in young adulthood. They have elevated risk taking. They start binge drinking more. They start to use drugs more. They think, I don't have to settle down for several years. I can live it up now as a youth. It starts to change their sexual patterns. Hooking up goes up. Casual sexual activity goes up when these youth start to devalue marriage. There's long-term effects for this too. Um, in a study that I did in 2012, I showed that I could actually predict when people got married in their 20s based on when they, what they told me about marriage when they were 18 in high school. As we see in these graphs, as pornography users start to de want to delay marriage and devalue marriage, it potentially is going to change their long-term trajectories towards those relationships. Now, one caution. I do want to make about this research. It's hard to predict what people are going to do 10, 20, 30 years down the road. Marital beliefs are extremely complex and multifaceted. And porn is probably just one small piece of what puts people on probable trajectories either towards or away from marriage. However, as we think about the social cost of pornography, and as we think about the relational cost of pornography, there is growing evidence that suggests that one of the potentially most devastating social costs of pornography is what we're going to see, not today, but in 20 years from now. Is this generation that's grown up using and accepting the pornography has now fundamentally changed how they think about relationships and families. Fundamentally changed how they think about marriage. And again, we don't know what the long-term effect of that's going to be, but there's evidence that that could drastically change what families in marriage look like. 